Thanks for everybody for coming by. So here we have uh, Vince Coley, who formerly from Eterwire, and uh, he is going to be talking about instant networks uh, using ultra-wideband uh, MIMO localizers. And uh, he'll be talking about a very interesting way of creating uh, some uh, multiple in multiple out radios in addition to have a very wideband communication, also to have a very good uh, geolocalization there. This is an external talk. Please remember to use good judgment in your questions. This will be uh, videotaped and uh, it will be available to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zoltan, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about ultra-wideband. And uh, I'd like to first say this was work that was done over a 10-year period of time, primarily, by several team members, and one of which, Dr. Jane Lynn, is also here. So she designed the chips, so if you have any questions, she's, I'm sure she'll be willing to uh, help out. Um, most of the work was completed about two years ago, so we might be a little rusty if you have some questions, but it's all here, and you know, if you have a question, we'll definitely get to the answer. Um, we have, there's a lot of, re when we entered this field, we, we found that there's a lot of rediscovering in the world of ultra-wideband. People discover something, they think it's new, and they dig a little deeper, and they find out it was done before, or in a different way, or whatever. And one of the hopes in this presentation is to share with you what the work we've done, so you can build upon it in whatever way. Um, the, um, hold on. And um, there's also a lot of slides here, and too much to go through in one hour. But I wanted it, we wanted it to be complete, and we'll give the slides to Zoltan. The file is, PowerPoint is quite large. So if you want the slides, you're welcome to them. And also, we'll give some background on the system we developed. And if you, to, to lead up to the MIMO and some of the applications, and I think that's a more interesting way of presenting the material, but if you want us to skip over that, we can do that too. And we also brought along one of the larger units with the multiple antennas, so we can describe that to you and uh, maybe pass it around as well. So with that as an introduction, okay, that was just the abstract for the talk. And um, again, the overview will give you a, um, we'll talk about how the, ultra how the Etherwire, ultra wideband system works. Uh, we'll talk about some of the projects we did over this 10 year period and the successes from it and how it, the research built upon itself. And finally, uh, the MIMO and how we perform beam forming and steering to increase range and data rate in, uh, in our, with our unit. Now, ultra-wideband has a lot of interesting characteristics. Ult our, obviously, RF has been around for a long time, hundreds, 100 plus years, lots of modulation schemes, lots of, uh, lots of uh, ways of using it, applications. Ultra-wideband, though, is relatively new. Um, compared to narrow bands, you know, there's uh, pro possibly hundreds, hundred possible uh, signaling scheme, and maybe there's ten or so that are typically used. Maybe a little more than that nowadays, um, but certainly there's room for more. And there's one of the things that attracts people to ultra wideband is the bandwidth of it, typically greater than 100 gigahertz. We chose in our work to focus on the low frequency below the uh, GPS L1, L2. And we chose to focus on it to do range resolution, like the company name, EtherWire, right, wireless networks and location. So we had a very narrow focus within this wide field of ultra-wideband. And some others, though, use it because they like the high data rate possibility. Uh, it has some very uh, good uh, techniques for um, time, uh, to time resolve multipath. Um, Low frequency was very important to us, obviously penetrating materials. We very much focused on handheld devices, indoors, human-worn, not airplanes or cars or ships or things, things for soldiers or people, firefighters, public safety. Um, also, it being episodic, it has some very interesting potentials for being low power. The waveform we chose is on the bottom there, which is the doublet, the bottom left. The uh, most, the, the last, we had six series of localizers, six generations. The, uh, the, the final one, the most recent one, is the one that I have here and also that I show on the, the slide here. We call it the Generation 6. And the block diagram is also more or less shown there. On the left, you see the receive antenna, which is a big loop antenna. 
not a whole lot of technology there. On the right is the uh, transmit antenna, and there is a lot of technology there, actually more than you might see. It's what's called a large current radiator. There are two loops. It's, we made a 2D antenna. You'll see the earlier revs of it were 3D, uh, basically bent copper. And in the middle between the two antennas is a driver chip. So it's a custom chip that we developed that uses flip chip technology, uh, chip on board. So actually it's bonded directly to uh, the PC board itself. Wanted a low capacitance connection between the antenna and the driver chip. And we'll talk more about the driver chips. And then in the middle is basically the, the key blocks of the circuitry. You see kind of highlighted in blue is the ether chip. That's the receiver chip. And it's, a, it's really a mixed digital analog chip that um, basically have some block diagrams for it, but that's what uh, has a time integrating correlator. It's basically pulling the signal from the noise to do ultra wide bands. And it is a system, it is an embedded system. In the earlier renditions, we used a Motorola cold fire processor, mainly because it was fully static. We, we looked at an ARM in later versions of the uh, system, and a lot of memory, obviously, to run the RTOS. We developed a, a RTOS to run with this system, and then obviously a time basis, which basically is a cell phone crystal. Okay. And just some word slides on the technical approach. Um, Basically, what we did is we formed a mobile ad hoc networks of devices, so no you know, mo true mobile ad hoc, no fixed infrastructures, and members can come and go at, at will. And one of the key parts of our system was that uh, we, would do, we would measure round-trip delays between nodes, and we'd accumulate a lot of those uh, delays and then push it through a, a multilateration algorithm and then come with range estimates and then it's very much a network-based system, five or more. You know, the sweet spot was more like 20 to 50 nodes. And you can come with relative positioning for the units, right, 3D position. So that was kind of one of our key objectives. Also, you can come with some modest data rate, about 1,000 uh, kilobits per second was kind of what we targeted. And as I said earlier, early in the presentation, we did actually take it a bit further using multiple antennas and start doing you know, beam forming and beam steering to get greater distances or potentially greater data. We tended to focus more on distance than data because we thought there are other ways of doing higher data rate than what we were working on. Um, on the bottom, we talk about uh, some of the, the timing. One of the, big one, of the, one of the big tricks of ultra wideband is to get accurate range estimates, you have to have accurate time basis. And there was a lot built into our technology to come with uh, using the uh, crystals to come with basically a couple of centimeter accuracy between nodes. And we'll talk a little bit about how we did that. Um, here's a block diagram for the system. Kind of went through that when talking about the Gen 6. But you see on the upper left is the um, receive antenna, so a loop antenna with an RF amplifier going into time integrating correlators and A to D converters. So basically that's the ether chip. On the bottom left, you see the processor with the, with the program storage and memory. Basically, that's, you know, the RTOS is running on there to basically, uh, to basically figure out what is noise and what is signal that it sees in the correlator bins. And then on the lower right is the, uh, the driver chip that's basically driving the uh, large current radiator antenna. Um, OK, there's just a couple of things on the chips. Uh, the uh, big thing is that when you're dealing with ultra-wideband, you're dealing with, you know, below part 15, right? Very, you're dealing with very, uh, very low, faint signals. And one of, it's, one of the tricks is you have to be able to pull a lot of signal from the noise. That's basically what you're doing in your receiver chip. You're uh, what's called a transmit-starved uh, link that you can only put out so much energy, but you have to be able to pull a lot of energy from the noise. So one of the tricks is you have to make sure your, ch your chip itself is very low noise. And that was a lot of work uh, and kind of talked about in the first bullet there, is coming with a logic family for our chip. They're full custom chips to basically um, have a very low noise floor. And um, believe me, when we started this project, if we thought we could buy chips to do this, we would have. But it turned out to be uh, soup to nuts, the whole thing. Uh, custom chip development, custom hardware, signaling, uh, software, antenna, um, quite a project. So talk a little bit about the antennas. So 
our problem that we're solving was location. And also we wanted this to be, like I said in the onset, something that's human worn or on a sensor or something that is relatively small and could be orientated in many different ways. So that puts a lot of pressure on your antenna. Your antenna technology has to be small. It has to be able to work at different orientations and near humans. And also it has to be omnidirectional because, you know, in the location you can't make assumptions about where the different antenna, where your, your, your neighbors are that you're, you're talking about, you're, talk, you're communicating to. And also it has to be, um, since we're dealing with pulse, it has to be uh, very flat across a very wide bandwidth. So that was a lot of work that we put into it. And we did a lot of work using, in the middle bullet there, using um, rather large um, uh, reference ta tam tame horns, they're called, like uh, three meter long horn antennas. There's some pictures that we show here. Obviously, those are not very practical to be low cost and human wearable. So we did a lot of work developing the antennas, and we came with a large current radiator, this uh, antenna that we show in our devices. Um, also, the uh, transmission that we use is episodic. I mean, that's basically what ultra wideband is. It's also called pulse radios. And um, we have, uh, you know, again, there's a lot in these slides, so I kind of just skip over the, uh, we have a CDMA, TDMA encoding built into it, and we have a very large sequence. We did, some of this work was funded by DARPA, and it had potential military, public safety kinds of applications. So they're very concerned about having very long codes and, you know, data buried in the noise and things like that. We use Kasami codes. Um, the reception, we used a time, basically a, a time integrating correlator, and basically the energy coming that's you know captured in the uh, in the loop antenna is uh, then put into different bins in the correlators in the ether chip, and then basically that's where the processor is interrogating. It's looking for peaks, looking for peaks in the uh, in the signal that's not noise. Um, a big part of our effort too was doing all the networking. Um, again, this is a mobile, mobile ad hoc network, uh, 5 to 20, ideally 50 kind of nodes. We always focused, we wanted these to be small and cheap. Whenever we had a design trade-off, instead of making it expensive, you know, I mean, nobody tries to make things expensive, but we made the assumption that if we can make them small and cheap, you'd have lots of them, so you'd worry less about range, for instance. So our sweet spot was always in the 10 to 30 meter range, although, like I said, using multiple antennas, we got up to 100 meters. But we always wanted good networks that you can have multi-hop multi kind of things. You can form uh, clusters within the network, and also you can selectively share data across the network. There's some of the things built in about that. Maybe, in, again, from the DARPA roots, maybe you don't want to use this for, for, you know, if an enemy gets it for targeting or things like that. We tried to make it so each unit itself was smart enough to develop its own location that would run the uh, multilateration. But in a lot of the work, we kind of just assumed that that would be something that come later, and we tended to have one, uh, like a computer, running the multilateration algorithms. Um, in the networking, we formed mesh networks. The uh, nodes would aggregate into clusters, and the um, clusters would all have consensus clocks across them. You know, again, because the time basis the, is very important to calculate accurate ranging, so we had a consensus clock, which is kind of like a flocking, bird flocking mechanism that would bring the furthest member of the network into, over time, into a closer uh, time basis as the, as the other members. Um, store and forward message, I'm just kind of hitting on the key points here. Storage, forward, message passing, if you want to use, again, we had just a trickle of data. The idea here is that this would be sensor kind of data. But it might be important to get some sensor data from one node across to the other end of the network. And you might want to have some priorities and things like that, so that was built into this as well. Um, we had TDMA and CDMA channelization. The TDMA was in the cluster, and then across clusters it was based on a code, CDMA. And the consensus clock, the uh, algorithm that we use to bring all the uh, clock, to bring the, the network clock um, uh, to, to um, basically maintain tight timing across the network. An important part of the technology was acquisition. And this is a 
you know, keep problem in ultra wideband because you're buried in the noise, right? You know, and, and you're mobile ad hoc, so you can't assume you got all the members there and you know there are more members. So you always have to be looking for more members in a way that you can do other stuff as well. So we developed the um, acquisition schemes, called a rapid acquisition scheme, that uh, it can basically periodically go out and look for other members. And if it's a member it already knew that was there, right? It says, hey, I'm there. The, the, this net, the, the localizer would know, I already have you, move on quickly. So that was part of it. Another part of it is that it can very quickly know there is a member versus that's just noise it's looking at. So there was a lot of work put into the uh, rapid acquisition algorithms that we used. And these are just some of the slides on that. As far as um, all the network layer, we, we had basically level three and below network. And we were very much focused on the phi in this effort. We assumed that people would build applications on top of that. And we just wanted to do a really good job with the phi and deliver good you know, range estimates and uh, good network level. But we did have a, a Mac and also link level, link, logical link control. And that was just the architecture of the Mac. And that was the link management. But what we focused on was like this block diagram here where we would have um, a unit, a localizer, connected to a, um, a PC, basically. And one of the challenges in this work was whenever you had uh, something other than the localizer connected to it, you couldn't use copper because that something other could become part of the antenna or if it's connected to other lab equipment or a wall outlet or whatever, all of a sudden you have cheat, cheat paths through, cheat path through cat copper for your network, so you get artificial, artificially short range estimates or distorted data. So it's very important in the setup, and we probably showed it too much in this slide, but everything between anything else and the localizer was using fiber. Um, so this way it was isolated. And in later work, we did more handheld kinds of things, and we tried to always keep it isolated. The idea that the military had was this would be a PDA kind of thing, and the localizer part of it would be an add-on unit, which would be on the back of a radio, back of the power pack, and it would be isolated that way from the rest of the unit. Um, one of the nice things about ultra wideband is that it's inherently LPI, LPD. It's sparse codes keep the power low. Um, you have long codes. So you really, uh, it's like looking, the analogy used was like looking for a submarine in the Pacific Ocean, you know, during the Cold War 10, 20 years ago. That's kind of the analogy of the processing power you'd be using. Uh, common filtering, two levels of common filtering that were used in our implementation. This slide kind of shows which the challenge of doing ultra wideband. Um, a is showing, the top one, is showing the transmit signal, A and C. And then B and D are showing what receives, the receive signal that you see. And B, you can kind of see the uh, doublets in there without the noise. But obviously, what we're dealing with in a, in a system in the real world is D. We have all the noise in there as well. And that's really the challenge of the algorithms is pulling all that signal, pulling that signal out of the noise. One of the other uh, interesting aspects of ultra wideband is the signal is, the, the energy is spread across a very broad spectrum. Um, and there's always this concern about ultra-wideband raising the noise floor. Well, you know, it's spread so far that you kind of work through some of these slides. Um, probably not very much of a concern. Um, like I said, the last, the generation six, the most recent um, uh, implementation of our localizer was like, these are the specs for it. And I have a unit here showing it. You know, even in prototype, it was targeted about $1,000 a unit. Um, battery life about half a day. Again, the node to node is about 30 meters. You can kind of read some of the uh, specs here. Five centimeter range, uh, RMS range accuracy. What we're told for a lot of applications is a good target is roughly the size of a beach ball. If you can come with pretty accurate estimates in a 3D the size of a beach ball, that's pretty good. And um, kind of that was our goal. Okay. I'll go through some of the projects we did so you can kind of see how the technology evolved. And um, you can kind of see the dates too on this to see how long it, we were working on it. Um, 
and see how much funding we had. So obviously you have far greater resources here and you know obviously technology has moved on and things like that. So new efforts uh, should certainly go be a lot easier than our effort. But we go back to the late 90s working on um, this very first project. It was working on a DARPA project. And with there, we had some localized. We already had the base technology. I'll show you in the next slide. But we developed the fourth generation to demonstrate mobile ad hoc networks with UWB ranging. We were told at the time by DARPA that that was something that was never done before. Um, we had to develop the UWB chips. Couldn't buy them. If we could find something available, we would have. And we also had kind of the specs that I showed there in bullet number three, 10 meter range, um, range accuracy to several centimeters, and then about 1,000. So the specs never really changed. Uh, a node rain, data rate of about 1,000 baud. And this slide actually shows the localizers that came before the generation three. And basically the very first one, which is on the left, is actually kind of interesting the work that the investigators did. The very first one showed that you can uh, create a pulse and you can launch that pulse into the far zone. And, they, and it wasn't very obvious at the time. I mean, um, they did just try half the pulse, but it would collapse. So they needed both the positive and the negative side of the doublet to uh, launch into the far zone. And the second generation showed that you can have a train of pulses. So they had like a PAL or a state machine driving that. The third generation, they actually made a receiver. And that's when they started getting involved in the receive antennas and showed that you can receive a pulse that's, and, and, and interpret a pulse that's launched into the far zone. And then the fourth generation, they started doing the networking. And these are showing the earlier chips that we had, the ether chip, the receiver chip on the left, and the transmitter chip on the right. Um, these are mostly, mostly analog implementation. So you could see a lot of test pads running vertically towards the right of the die. They tried to have every analog, every circuit, they could have a way of probing both sides of it. Every, critical, every circuit that they felt critical and every implementation had to be probable on both sides. Uh, you can see the correlators in the chip on the lower left. The, um, on the right side is a driver chip. And basically, it was, a, it was an H bridge. At least that one was, the driver two. We had a, another driver we used later on called driver three. But the driver two was basically an H bridge, like a stepper motor controller. And basically, it was a current mode antenna that we used. And then, again, in this early DARPA project, um, and this was done in Marin. This is where the lab was at the time. Um, we demonstrated ad hoc peer-to-peer -peer networking with eight nodes with rapid acquisition and, and flooding of range data. So you can basically you know, introduce and take away members to the network. And we use these, I think those are called kitty condos, that's what those were. Because again, if you had anything made, anything metal, you'd have all kinds of false positive data because they'd be antennas all of a sudden. So we tended to use all this wood and, and umbrella stands and things like that at different heights, elevation. We did outdoors and we did indoors. I guess these pictures show the outdoor kind of data. And actually, it was a lot easier. This work was done in Nicasio, which is a town in San Rafael, very close to Skywalker Ranch. And just as an aside, when we moved from there down here to a lab in Sunnyvale, we actually took a few steps backwards because there was no background RF there. It was pristine because up in the hills, maybe a cell site. But when we came down in the valley here, it became a whole nother challenge. And we also did work at Berkeley near with BWRC, and they had a cell site right near their labs. So that was a real challenge as well. Um, then the second project we had, so you know, DARPA like we did, and this was with the US Navy, ONR. And this one was more, um, uh, they, they said, let's, let's see how good you guys are. And we know you can do some of this stuff in, in Marin and you know, in a really nice environment. Well, let's see how you can do around cargo containers. Um, and um, the idea here was that you, I guess the application they had in mind was, you know, a lot of uh, uh, stuff for the military shipped in cargo containers and they would like to have a way of tagging and IDing things and all that. I guess that's kind of the application they had in mind. But they were really curious to see if the, if the units could work in the container and if they can communicate with units outside the container. So that was actually the two, two points here on the bottom. We had to uh, demonstrate the ability to communicate inside and outside the container. 
and we also demonstrated operation inside the container. And inside the container was very challenging because you get a very large resonance. And it kind of says it there at 87 megahertz, 120, 138. And one of the unique properties of our system is that you can control the doublet separation. So we actually had a way of canceling out, of avoiding the resonance frequencies in this application. That was kind of the aha we got from this project. And there's some slides on that. So this one first shows on the lower right, shows the, I guess, a primitive drawing of two cargo containers next to each other. And this was out at the Port of Oakland, so we actually had some time out there to do this. And we actually were able to have localizers in adjacent containers communicate basically through the uh, wood floor. That's what they did. When you started stacking them, it became nearly impossible. But when they're on the floor, we can do it. And then we also went out and bought a container as part of this project. And, um, they, and you can do that. You can buy, even small companies can buy containers. They're not very expensive. And we actually set up on the upper left-hand corner, you can see it, a couple of localizers inside the container. And whether we opened or closed the door, it didn't really matter very much. And we did actually, the PSD, 3D PSD diagram in the middle there is showing, if you look at a cross-section of the container, you can see the power, uh, the, uh, power in the uh, Z direction versus the frequency in the Y direction inside the cross-section of the container. So when we, like I said in the earlier slide, we did found where the peaks were, we basically just tuned our doublets to avoid those peaks, and we actually set up a little network inside a container. Kind of cool. Um, next project we had was, um, this is another DARPA project, and basically this is a lot of the work with the large current radiator. So again, making the transmit antennas uh, better. And one of the big things, okay, if, you, if you're doing ultra-wideband, you can't put out more power, that's kind of regulated by the FCC. Um, you can only do so much on the receive side, and we did as much as we could, but we tried to do is try to be very clever the way we put out the pulses, we call it pulse shaping. So put out pristine pulses. So that's what this was all about, working on the driver chip that, control, that generated the pulses and working on the antenna that propagated the pulses to the far zone. So that's what this was all about. And, um, and some of the, the uh, ahas were shown on the bottom there that we, we had in this. I'll show you in some of the slides. We came with a kind of a novel uh, antenna design methodology for both the receive and the transmit side. At the time, and there might be better tools nowadays, but we use the Remcon FDTD simulation tool for basically, uh, you know, basically what the uh, investigators did is came with all the extra terms to model Maxwell's equations for non-sinusoidal functions or periodic functions using uh, numerical methods such as FDTD. So they'd come with different shapes for antennas and then they'd try modeling it in Remcon and FDTD. And then they would try building them. And usually the they would get some kind of promising results using the simulation, and they tried building them, and then either they find it's not practical to build, or the results just weren't as good when the actual unit. So if you kind of follow through these slides, that, this, these flow charts, that's what they were doing. You know, simulating using a clever set of tools, then building the antennas using lab equipment, testing them, and then going the other way and improving the next time around. So that was a big part of this project, is coming with the whole, the whole uh, methodology. And then we settled with this large current radiator. And if it, yeah, OK, the AV, AV, AV file works here. So basically, this is showing the, uh, this is the FDTD simulation, showing the field strength building up in the antenna. And then all of a sudden, you'll see it break off and launch omnidirectional into the far zone. And you do get a little bit of a, I don't know what the term is, uh, a dimple on top. So you get a little bit of that, but part of the challenge was obviously to minimize that and make sure that you're moving enough so that's never pointing to the object of interest. So, and that led up to the Generation 5 localizer. So the one I showed before in the DARPA work was four, and the one we have now is six, so this is the one in the middle. And the earlier antennas, like I said, were 3D. They were basically, um, you know, uh, 
made it a bent metal. And um, it was very easy to prototype that way. It had a lot of different advantages. And we also made them like this board stack approach, which has its good and its bad. The, the good is that it was very modular so that we can change system components. The bad was connectors are inherently unreliable, especially when you're doing field work. And especially when you're doing this kind of work where you're debugging so many different things, you want your hardware to be solid. But it worked. Um, on the bottom stack, the, obviously, was the power board. And then one board was what we call the ether board that had the uh, receive chip. Another board had the processor on it with the memory and the uh, ties into the um, you know, Motorola debugger and things like that. And then the top board was the antenna board with the driver chips. So it was all stacked together like that. And it actually was good because it ran, we used this for a couple of years during the projects back then and made a lot of iterations to the components. And it was small. That was always important. We always knew that we can make things smaller, but we wanted to start with something that was reasonably small. Then the next project we did, we started focusing on applications, and this was with the Marines. And, you know, obviously in this whole field of ultra-wideband back then, very little commercial interest, at least in what we did. Most of it came from the government and military. That's why you see all these slides here. Um, this one was with Mount, with the, uh, the Marines, where basically they wanted to be able to track soldiers inside buildings. And they're very interested in not just soldiers, but firefighters. And, and if you look at the time frame, this is around 9-11, right? So that's obviously of great interest back then in our country. Um, so we came with, uh, so if you look on the bottom, the two successes there, basically if you look at a room, the little 3D representation there, and there's a few localizers stationary, and you can move in that path, and we demonstrated that you can, you can display in the screen where you are in a room as you move through, and also using some software, you can also come with the shape of the room, which is kind of novel, because, you know, you can't assume walls, right, when you're doing this. The units don't know where they're walls. They just know you, you generally don't walk through walls. So we actually had a little algorithm in there that would come with the shape and size of the room. And we also did a lot of work in penetration back then. That was important because this is very much for indoor applications and what materials, uh, I guess what was important to them is where doors were or where possible uh, uh, places of entry are. I'm just going the wrong way into a building. And then this is showing the actual pictures from that. Um, on the lower left there, you can see the units on these. Uh, OK, so we, had, we moved on a little bit from the, uh, from the kitty condos. And this one, we actually put the uh, units on top of umbrella stands. That's what those are. And we had different heights. And then one of them we had on wheels. And you can move it through. And that's basically the person moving through the room. And then on the lower right, we had a little GUI there showing the representation of the room. And uh, the 3D multilateration was running in, inside that computer as well. Um, we also did some work in the penetration of UWB through materials. And um, to some of the, the slides and the data collected there. Uh, what we Obviously, what you'd find is if you have enough conductive mass, it's going to absorb any kind of material. Uh, sorry, any, any signal, no matter how low frequency or how strong. Um, but for common building materials, the spectrum that we chose was pretty good. And also, we'd always try to make it so they have a few extra paths in case you artificially got a very long path because it's blocked. Your algorithm would be smart enough to know, well, ignore that one. This other way of constructing that path seems to be more accurate. So that was kind of built in as well. Um, so then we moved on from that, and we had some money from the NSF, a grant, and we did this back with Berkeley with the BWRC, Berkeley Wireless Research Center. And this kind of gets involved with one of the uh, topics here of the, uh, of the MIMO antennas. So they were very interested, OK, you can put these units on people and track them. Well, can you also kind of make statements about people that don't have uh, don't have the units on them. Can you be able to find, let's say, a hostage situation or rescue, whatever, other people in the building as well as those wearing tags? So we used an approach, I guess the term for that is tomography, where um, backscatter radiation, I think that's what it is, where basically um, we would be able to take some extra data that we'd get from the network and process it offline 
the real challenge, today I think you could probably do it in real time, but there's a tremendous amount of processing, and, and this is a big, big part of the Berkeley work, was coming with the algorithms to do that, to basically make statements about humans or objects of interest in the field as well. And I have some slides showing you about that. And the second point there is also doing uh, focusing and beam forming, where you can um, you know, get greater distance. Uh, again, we focus more on distance than data rate, because that was kind of our you know, we figured other people would work on the data rate part of the problem, but, um, and we did actually have some interesting ahas there that um, basically three, playing with the transmitters, right, it wasn't as much the receiver side, putting additional transmit antennas on there, we could increase the field strength and get, uh, and get greater range. Um, and then this slide shows the tomography part of that work, where we set up an experiment where we had in the middle there, you can kind of see that's isotonic water, basically water the salinity and volume of a typical human moving in a field surrounded by the um, ultra-wideband. And basically we would obviously know we were moving it, and then we'd come with the, from that kind of de develop the algorithms to, um, you know, determine its location in, in the field of localizers. And the data was actually pretty good. There's some backup slides I have in here on that that we collected. And then we also did work on the focusing and beam forming. And that was pretty good too. The, um, we used three transmitters and a single receiver. Um, and we were actually able to uh, get a focus zone that received power that's nine times that from a single transmitter. So it, it was additive. It did the, um, and um, again, I have more slides on that and more work that we did in that field. So then we went back to chips. The chips were getting a little old and um, dusty uh, doing all this system work, if you've been following the years and everything and the, the dates here. And we we're uh, fortunate enough, enough to get a NIST ATP award. It's kind of a scholarship for small companies. And they're very interested in making these coin size. And we always wanted to make things smaller too. That was a big part of our work. So we always designed the radio chips so that they could be put on a CMOS process and the processor could be integrated with the memory. And you know, nowadays, obviously, with, uh, with you know, 45, 30 nanometer, whatever technology, this seems kind of old. But at the time, uh, we had half micron parts. And we're looking at getting in 0.35 and 0.15 micron uh, technology. So this goes back a few years. but you know, obviously could still be applied today. And the real challenge with a lot of this is the radio stuff really doesn't need the deep submicron. Um, it's really the processor and memory, which ine inevitably is the biggest part of your chip anyway, a and the movement of the fab because people don't make the old technologies. So in order to stay current, you have to be able to move your radios forward to just have gains in other areas. And the thing that works against you in doing this is these technologies also tend to be very low voltage. So you're dealing with more noise margins and things like that. That was a big part of Jane's work on this project. Um, and we came with a tool flow. We did this, I mean, if you've been following the dollars, you know, this is to a large extent self-funded in grants and things like that. So we came with a tool flow that we can insert bloats and shrinks in order to scale to go to the uh, technologies that we wanted and then artificially make bigger the analog blocks that we needed to. And it worked. I mean, obviously, in, a, in an ongoing company, a chip company, you'd probably have a more automated flow, but it did work for what we were doing. So I mentioned that we had a new driver chip along the way, and um, this is a driver 3B. And a lot of the work in this chip was to make uh, what's called pulse shaping in order to get better range, we wanted to make better pulses, and the antenna was part of that, and doing the chips was part of that. And this came with a, a new approach of doing pulse shaping for the uh, driver chip. And we also came with a succession of, um, of uh, new ether chips, receiver chips. And one of the challenges, too, when you're doing chip design with system design and everything else at once, is you know, you're running chips and you can't afford to have too many mistakes. So we actually tended to do these reticle kind of things. We'd have multiple versions of the chips, sometimes with little things changed here and there. 
so that hopefully from that run you'll get a few chips you can use because you really only need a few chips and then you could always zero in on what worked and make more of them later. So that's what we started doing with the Ether 6 and then the Ether 7 and the block diagrams are kind of shown there for the chips. And then the Ether 8 and 9, we started doing more work with Oki Semiconductor and the 0.15 uh, SOI process. And with this, we also started putting the ARM processor and the memory on the chips as well. So the ultimate goal was to have one chip that was the receiver chip with the processor and memory, and then one chip that was a driver chip, maybe eventually one with both of them, but the driver chip would tend to be married to the antenna, and the antenna would tend to be part of the packaging of this so-called coin-sized localizer. Um, another project we did, okay, I'm going the right direction. Okay, this one was a back to DARPA, and some of these overlapped a little bit, but they had a project um, uh, called NetX that they basically wanted to have networking in extreme environments. And um, what we did here, and this also gets involved with the multiple antennas and things, they're very interested in um, having radio technology that could work when you have all these other radios and jamming technology and things like that going on. So the, the tests, and tests that they required were pretty severe. And in fact, at one point, we actually did go down to Edwards Air Force Base. They have the big anechoic chamber there and did con conduct some uh, experiments because we needed a 100, 100 meter kind of range to do this. And that was the largest anechoic chamber on the West Coast. Um, so the, the successes are shown on the bottom there. We developed the flat antenna. The, you know, up until this time, up until then, this, before this, we had the 3D antenna, and this one we got to the flat antenna. We also demonstrated multiple antennas, so the multiple transmit antennas in an arrays, because the, the NSF work was using tame horns and things like that, so now we used our own little antennas to do this. And we produced the new Ether chip, the third bullet there, the Ether 7, which had a uh, higher data rate that was also, in, well, that was important to DARPA, probably less important to us, but we did it because it was important to them. They had some targets for what they needed for data rates. We supported some partners in this, uh, Tilcordia and, and Boeing at the time, and we successfully demonstrated 100, 100 meter range and actually did in a parking, parking garage right near, I'll tell you the story on that in a minute. So this is kind of the NetX program that we're involved in. And again, it was very much focused on the dismount soldier. So that was kind of always, we always focused on people and sensors, small things. I mentioned we developed the 2D antenna. We moved from the 3D to the 2D here. It allowed much better packaging. It was easy to manufacture. You kind of got tired of bending all the sheet metal. Um, and it basically became our standard antenna technology. And you can kind of see going on the right there from the 3D, those big loops to the 2D on the bottom right, and you can see those capacitors in the middle. That too became a little bit of a bear for us to produce. So, okay, I'll show you that in a minute. So um, we uh, came with different uh, ways of putting these, this, the capacitance that we needed between the two loops. And on the left, we actually experimented with foil to kind of dial in the, 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 what we needed. And then we came with a way of doing it using Ferroflex B, well it says it there, Ferroflex B, BC24 material. So basically we, when we dialed in the resistance that we needed, we basically produced a very special PC board with Ferroflex material in it. You know, you can do that nowadays for multiple, you know, they use, I guess they do it for buses to control the capacitance. Um, but we used it to basically uh, control the resistance between the two loops of the antenna. So it became something you can produce in volume. Also, it's kind of hidden in the picture there, but you can see between on the bottom center of the, the antennas, that was a driver chip right there. We actually had it chip on board. In the later implementations, we had it with a, a, a epoxy goop over it, but for that one, we had a little, a little uh, uh, cover that we put over the chip. But the chip was mounted right on the board. There's no package using flip chip technology. Um, and then we also, uh, well this is just getting involved with um, some of the simulations we did and the inner layers of the board and how it was made for the uh, 2D antennas. And we tried different sizes antennas 
and we actually tried the larger ones and the smaller ones. The larger ones really didn't buy very much. A properly designed smaller antenna was just as good for the work that we did in terms of uh, range. But that was as large as we got, the ones there. And we made arrays, and we simulated the arrays using, um, using uh, the XDTD, Remcon simulation, and we came with some optimal spacing between the antennas. So that was kind of what was going in here in this slide. And then we came with a version of our Gen 6 antenna that you can kind of see here that um, would have, uh, again, we go back to the connectors. So although this time was a little easier because these are antennas, they weren't, uh, we didn't have um, the electronic components connected through the uh, connectors. But we came with this approach that you can stack multiple antennas and, and change them out to this way you can experiment. And I mentioned I go back to the story of the garage in Sunnyvale. If you go over by the train station here in Matilda, in Sunnyvale, I guess that's Mountain View that way, there's um, this big antenna, this big garage that I think there's like three or four levels below grounds. And it's kind of a, oh, I guess it's a public video. Um, you know, a lot of companies go there to do RF testing. <laughs> it's, it's as close as you can get to an anechoic chamber without, and, and, and the city of Sunnyvale was very, uh, uh, you know, we, we just had a sign, a release, and we were, um, you know, uh, and other companies do that as well. And you go down there and do your uh, RF testing. So it was actually kind of neat. And we set up a system, uh, like shown in the picture, or similar to what we show here in the unit have here. And we actually did it, did get a node to node of uh, 93 meters using the four antennas. So 100 meters was kind of the goal, and we came pretty close to that. And we also came with some, um, this is just some of the technical data from it, showing the um, bit error rate and the range for the, so these are point to point. So these were no longer location, these are point to point. And we also came with, uh, actually with Telcordia, our partner, we came with this very nice uh, uh, software to thoroughly test the link of the nodes. So basically when you establish a link, then this software will report all kinds of bit error rate and different statements about the uh, quality of the link and, the, um, and any kind of interference in the link and things like that. So we learned more about what was happening between the localizers. Up until that point, we basically just took the data and interpreted it to do location, but this actually let us learn more about the links themselves. Then we had another project. Uh, DARPA kind of like what we were doing, and this was in NEST, um, Network Embedded Sensor Technology, I think this in NEST was, and here they were concerned about um, having the localizers themselves do the uh, time of flight, basically no longer have a central unit that would do the multilateration, they would have the multilateration done on the units themselves, and a different kind of multilateration. Usually multilateration assumes that you see a couple of satellites, because it's very GPS centric. This assumes that you have many sources of data, and none of them are very good. I mean, as a network, they're probably good, but you know, you could have block paths or units that come and go from the network. So we also had to build into that kind of intelligence that you would have a timestamp for every range estimate, and newer estimates were better than treated at a higher rate, a higher level than older estimates. And also, you'd have some way of double checking to see if you had a block path if you're really dealing with a multipath as opposed to direct path between nodes because you have block signal. And the second part of this project was also to look at channel models and um, near body effects and things like that. So some data came out of this work. So this we started, you know, this gets involved with the multilateration that we did between, between units at the, at the node level. And, um, you know, making basically the way multilateration, you think of it as a succession of ellipse, of a, o, overlapping ellipse, ellipsoids, and that's what they show in the, the graph on the right. Um, and then we also got involved with um, coming with the channel model, because they wanted the math and the channel model for our, our work as well, and came involved with different cases where you have a line of sight and an online of sight, that's what's shown in the bottom there. So this is deterministic with a line of sight, and this is with no line of sight. And also it came with some uh, body proximity effects. Okay, because again, these are sensors, they could be human wear worn, so looked at modeling the near body effects. 
And um, we also got involved in later project with doing the um, beam forming, where basically you would have a smaller, now this is actually the toughest of them all, where you have on the left there, you'd have a network of localizers that would communicate, and then some of them would be a little bigger than others, and they would actually have the multiple antennas and all that, and they'd transmit to some platform further away, 100, 100 meters kind of in the work that we did, and then they would have their own little networks and then communicate to other networks elsewhere. And that's what this uh, got involved with. So this actually, let's see, what time are we at now? Are we over the one hour? I was kind of getting more into backup slides. I can keep going or I'll just take you through this data real fast. So I mentioned in doing the, uh, doing, because I know you're interested in the multiple antennas, doing the, um, the tomography and the, the beam forming. These are just showing the experiments that we set up and the uh, set up a track with the human, the isotopic water moving on this track and the far antennas that we use. These are before we had the multiple antennas that we, um, the, uh, the antenna arrays like we show here and then the focusing results that we did and on the bottom they can see the conclusion. The electric and magnetic fields can be superimposed spaced spatially and temporally with su sufficient precision so that the field strains can add as opposed to um, having them cancel out. Sorry, the uh, picture overlap, the slide, the words there. And this is just some of the data on the uh, focusing. We do lose with one over R squared decrease in power, right? But it's offset by the uh, N squared increase in the power due to the focusing points. That was the idea of increasing the field strengths. And then just some of the 3D views of the uh, focus zones that we created. And then these were just some simulations we did on the receive intent of the data. And that was pretty much it. Yeah, thank you. And I have the unit here. If anyone wants to, I could pass it around. You can come up and see it. I'm not sure which is the easiest way to do it if anyone's interested. Any questions? That's the sixth. That's the last one we did. I think it was a sixth. Ah, which generation is that? That's the sixth generation, so that's the most recent, and I think it's a 6A as we call it. So that actually had the latest technology with the multi antennas and chips. We did smaller packaging, but in terms of the board level, that was the biggest. That was the, the last one. And you can kind of see in the middle, you can kind of see the ether chip. And um, you can see the, uh, on the antennas, you can see the little blob of epoxy in the middle of the two loops, and the driver chip is there. And you can't, well, it's buried in the inner layers, but those antennas have the Ferroflex material. And, uh, you know, obviously multiple antennas and multiple driver chips. So this is a, the software controlling this was a little special because it was coordinating in time and, and, and it was coordinating the four driver chips. Any other questions? Yes. So one of your, your dive pop, you have a slice that's a very big dive pop. Yes. There's a two deck. So the question was, one of the die plots has two DACs. Um, Jane, maybe you can answer that. What's the question? Why we have two DACs, or why? I can see the DAC plot has a different sign on the same die. Maybe that was my mistake. Jane, you might want to step up to the microphone so this way they catch it in the recording, please. And I'll try to find that slide. Yeah, the one. You can show the one. Well, that's not a good one. Uh, I'll find it with you. Thank you. Oh, yes, this is the one. Okay. 
Uh, this deck actually is a lot, uh, it's just try to uh, using uh, seven bits or six bits to control uh, some kind of biasing. We just uh, use um, kind of current mirror. Those are just uh, try to get the biasing current um, right for some uh, bias. All these, a lot of analog circuits that use low stack six bits, seven bits to control the current. Okay. Those are uh, not like uh, the, the deck of use for the eye or the, for the error of digital conversion. This is just to control the current. For the, for the, for the current, yeah, yeah, just using six bits control the accuracy of the current, yeah. Okay, Any other questions? Oh, how much power, the question is how much power do we transmit with this one? Um, it was, yeah, it's kind of hard to say because there's so many different ways of, I mean, when, you know, measuring the power, but it was, yeah, it was way below part 15, I know that. <laughs> do, you, do you remember any of the, drivers, the driver? Yeah. Drivers. And you might want to go into the microphone if you have that. Um, the power consumption of these drivers? Um, no, they, I think he means transmitted or radiated power. Oh, no idea, but the, the antenna actually, is because it's very low impedance, it's using only a few ohms, like a one or uh, two ohms, so it's, uh, it's a lot of power consumed. <laughs> but the, the power out of this, um, I, I, I would say that this, this large current radiator, radiator is the power efficiency, I, won't, I don't think it's very good. <laughs> But uh, we're just using a, it's a kind of using processing again. The signal is very small. It's, it's lower than kind of lower than noise. It's below noise levels. But we're using integrate, uh, doing correlation, integrate uh, like certain chips. So they got a uh, processing again. But the signal level is low. And following, following the question, is the signal level very low? At the beginning of your presentation, uh, you. You said you, your group developed uh, low and low noise uh, uh, circuits. So is this an analog low noise circuit or a digital low noise? Yeah, the question was, and then maybe Jane can answer it, we, the, we developed low noise logic family. Because that was a question, right, on the chip itself. And what is the dominant noise in this case? This uh, receiver chip actually is the, the, the reason we call it low noise logic because it's actually it's a DC, it's all, all the logic has a DC current, a DC bias. So it's, a, so it's not a digital circuit, it's an analog circuit, it's a small signal swing. And it's so, it's, current. yeah, current, yeah, current, yeah. So it's very low noise, it's, but the, of course, it's a, at the cost of it has DC bias. And, but the, because this, the, when you really use it, the do, uh, we only using like saying uh, transmit the average average time duty time duty cycle is saying one percent. So the total power this chip I remember the receiver chip is about hundred milliamp. But if you only using one uh, one hundredth of the time, then it's only one milliamp, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, this chip is DC, but it's all DC bias has DC bias. So okay. low noise because of its DC bias. Uh, yeah. And in this case, the noise, uh, the main source of the noise, uh, uh, still has some of the noise. Definitely, yeah. But it doesn't have a low kind of digital noise. We do have the the we do have three stage of the um, clock, and the, the last one of the uh, one of the stage of the clock is the is the uh, the digital is a logic is a digital it's digital circuit it's not a small swing it's a full swing but the less, that one is done it's it's that's not a, a very fast clock that's the our the large time scales uh, clock the other one yeah but the digital switch yeah but the width, most of circuit is is small swing only yeah any other questions Well, thank you for having us, and uh, 
you know, any anything we can do to further uh, this work, please feel free to uh, uh, either through Zoltan or the emails on the slides. I'd be happy to get any answers to any of the questions you might have. Thank you.